Uh, one of the ways to do it is to identify your, your trigger eating cues and practice stimulus control. Uh, so you're trying to stay away from uh, the foods that, or the cues that tell you that you need to eat. Uh, every time, uh, I don't know, Survivor comes on television, you, you, you run to the, the refrigerator for a uh, pint of ice cream or something. Uh, you know, if that's your cue, then you need to uh, control that. Uh, you need to eat slow with self-control techniques. Uh, you need to boost your metabol metabolism with aerobic exercise. You need to create small-term contracts when small goals are reached. Uh, so if you wanted to lose five pounds, then uh, of course uh, write a new contract that you're going to lose two pounds in the next week. Enlist your family and friends to, uh, to provide social support. Uh, if you don't have the uh, support of your, your family and your friends, then it's not going to happen. Uh, maintain awareness by careful uh, self-monitoring and record-keeping. Uh, some individuals, especially obsessive-compulsive people, are really kind of interested because they don't have any problems losing weight because they write everything down. And they just keep making lists of things that they need to do, and this is how I'm going to lose weight. And it really works for them. Uh, but of course, those of us who are not obsessive-compulsive, how in the world are we going to lose weight? We need to, to uh, take a cue from the obsessive compulsives. Anticipate urges, cravings, and high-risk situations with relapse prevention therapy. Uh, so you know that if you go out, uh, if, you're, if your spouse takes you out for, for a Valentine's dinner, uh, that, that uh, they're going to want to get you drunk and uh, so that they don't have their way. I just think it doesn't happen. <laughs> or they're going to try to feed you chocolate or something to make you more, more vulnerable. Well, you know that that's going to happen, so don't let them do it to you next time. Don't let them take advantage of you. Self-directed uh, self di uh, dieting. Uh, Self-directed dieting is recommended for people with mild to moderate obesity unless the individual has a history of weight cycling. Weight cycling is where is yo-yo dieting, where you lose weight. You lose the weight you want to lose, and then uh, you immediately go out and uh, celebrate by, by eating a, a big steak dinner with uh, a chocolate cake, you know, that kind of silly thing. That's uh, weight cycling. For people who can uh, not diet successfully on their own, there are commercial programs like the Weight Watchers or Jimmy Craig, uh, and they can work. Uh, if you need that, that type of support, then that's what you need to do. Uh, very low calorie uh, and surgery are recommended only for people with medical problems complicated by obesity. Um, the surgery works, but it's also dangerous. It can cha change your metabolism. Uh, I, I knew two cases in, uh, in Montana uh, where the individuals uh, had uh, their stomachs uh, tied. Uh, they made their stomachs smaller. And both of them actually lost weight. Uh, but one of them died within about three weeks, and the other died of leukemia about six months after her, her uh, surgery. Uh, why was that? Uh, well, the one died because uh, he was supposed to eat small meals, and he was eating too much food, and it uh, blew his stomach up, and he bled to death. Uh, the other one, like I said, died of leukemia because it changed her metabolism. And when it changed her metabolism, it kicked her into leukemia. Uh, for people with diabetes and other medical complications, medical supervision is recommended. Uh, individual counseling and behavioral weight uh, loss programs are considered appropriate for those with eating disorders. By promoting the availability of affordable, healthy food and beverages, how, uh, oh, th this is how communities can support uh, families and support healthy living. Uh, a lot of individuals uh, complain about Bosch's, and I don't blame you for complaining about Bosch's. I complain about Bosch's from time to time. Uh, how in the world can we get Bosch's to, to start stocking better food? Uh, the problem is, of course, that better food is more expensive. Will people actually buy that food is the question. Uh, one of the things that you can do on the reservation, this is what, uh, what they were doing up on the Fort Belknap, uh, was that they were starting a cooperative uh, uh, grocery store. The cooperative grocery store sold everything at cost. Uh, unfortunately, you don't really understand how much, what kind of cost we're dealing with until you start transporting food from uh, wherever you're transporting it to uh, uh, wherever you are. Uh, transportation costs are kind of expensive. 
so how do communities and families support healthy living by promoting the availability of affordable healthy foods and beverages, uh, by supporting healthy food and beverage choices, uh, by encouraging breastfeeding, as odd as that seems, encouraging physical activity or limiting sedentary activity among youth and teens. Any idea of why breastfeeding will, is good for healthy living? Why is breastfeeding good? It has um, nutrients that formulas cannot That's true. It does. Produce it natural. Does. Mm -hmm. Natural. Yeah. Well, it is natural. Mm -hmm. uh, it also uh, supports uh, children that breastfeed are uh, less likely to be obese. As interesting as that is, it also uh, helps the mother. Isn't disease as well? I'm Isn't disease as well? Uh, right, yeah, you get, uh, you get uh, antibodies from your mother's milk. Uh, so that's, that's re really quite positive. Uh, it also helps the mother. Uh, it helps her lose weight as well. Encouraging physical, physical activity or limiting sedentary activity among youth and teens. Creating safe communities that support physical activity. Encouraging communities to organize for change. And that's the way communities. I apologize. This is what people are supposed to look like. I'm just kidding. She's almost skeletal. Um, eating disorders. We're going to start talking about eating disorders. Anorexia nervosa is an eating disorder characterized by failure to maintain body weight and a BMI below uh, 18. Um, people that suffer from anorexia nervosa have slowed thyroid functions. Their heartbeat is your, tends to be irregular. Uh, they have low blood pressure, they have irregular breathing, uh, dry and yellowed skin, which is always attractive, uh, brittle bones, anemia, lightheadedness, dehydration, swollen joints, reduced muscle mass, intolerance to cold temperatures, and of course they're starving themselves to death. The other thing about uh, women with uh, anorexia is their hair is brittle. Did I say brittle hair? Brittle bones. Brittle, their hair is brittle as well, so it tends to break. Uh, or the split ends, that's what they call it. Okay. <laughs> their split ends uh, tend to go all the way to their scalp, uh, which is kind of ugly and nasty and not the nicest thing in the world. Anorexia has a mortality rate of between 2 and 15%. So it is one of the most deadly uh, mental illnesses uh, that we have. Uh, some people will <coughs> binge eat compulsively, but without the compulsive com uh, compensatory compensatory purging or fasting, and this is known as binge eating disorder. These individuals tend to be relatively obese because they binge eat and then they don't get rid of the food. Bulimia nervosa involves compulsive eating, binging followed by uh, self-induced vomiting or large doses of laxatives, and of course that's the purge. Uh, some will compulsively purge while others only purge after binging. Uh, some will consume up to 10,000 calories in one sitting before purging. How much is 10 calories? It's a dozen donuts with icing, and it is a pepperoni. It's a large pepperoni pizza. That's how much 10. Could, could, could you guys eat that? You can't eat a large pizza with uh, a dozen donuts with icing? No, 20, 30 years ago. 20, 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> when you're in shape, you're going to have done it that way. I know. Uh, but that's what it looks like. So these individuals are doing that. I don't know if you've ever been around somebody when they were actually binge eating, but their stomach will pooch out like they are pregnant, and they, they look pregnant. And then, of course, they'll go into the bathroom and, and force themselves to vomit, and they vomit the whole thing up. <clears throat> now, oddly, if you talk to these individuals, some of them say that it tastes better coming back up than it does going back down. It hasn't had a chance, it hasn't had a chance to digest. Uh, so, and a lot of them will eat really soft food, so it feels a lot better when it comes out. Mm -hmm. As strange as that is. We had a lady that came in one night uh, to the emergency room, and she had been binge eating. And she, when she told us what she ate, we thought, you know, and we're, we're adding all this stuff up in our heads, and it's like 15,000 calories. She was out to here. I mean, she was huge. She tried to force herself to vomit, she, she couldn't. So she wanted us. <laughs> to give her an emetic, a, something to make her vomit, so that she could get rid of all that stuff. She was very, very uncomfortable, and she was afraid that she was going to you know, pop her stomach. She didn't pop her stomach. We didn't give her an emetic. 
but we did keep her there until uh, until her uh, uh, food started going down into her small intestine, so it relieved the pressure in that area. About half the college uh, women will participate in bulimic behavior from one time or another, but to be diagnosed with bulimia nervosa, the individual must have at least one binge episode a week for a minimum of three months. Lack of control over uh, eating, behavior uh, designed to avoid weight gain, and persistent exaggerated concern about weight gain. Uh, we see a lot of models that are bulimic. Uh, we see a lot of individual, we see a lot of uh, uh, gymnasts uh, that are, uh, that are bulimic, and uh, this is the way they control their, uh, their weight. The other way that they control their weight, if you've ever been around models, I'm sure you guys have all dated models, but uh, the other way that the, <laughs> John's not in here, he's just sitting there. The other way that they control the, their weight is by smoking. Uh, smoking reduces your hunger, so that's another way that they do it. Uh, there was a lady by the name of uh, Kathy Ireland. Uh, she was a swimsuit model. She was an SI swimsuit model. And then she became an actress. Uh, well, as long as she was a model and an actress, she was a chain smoker. And that's the way she didn't eat. And one of the reasons that she was so attractive was because she had a full face. You know, instead of these skeletal women that look like half skeletons, uh, she had a full face and she had a relatively uh, full figure. Uh, but she was relatively skinny at the same time. As soon as she, uh, as soon as she, as soon as she stopped <laughs> acting and modeling, she tried to give up smoking. Uh, she has, she's being treated for cancer right now because of a lot of smoking that she did. But she used to be a, a, a chain smoker. Uh, she also has really gained weight, just a ton of weight. Poor old Kathy Ireland. She's been in a couple movies. You probably would recognize. Oh, she was the. Uh, What's the movie? It's a it's a football movie where almost everybody uh, they kick almost everybody off the team and they they play both ends and Scott Bakula is the quarterback. I don't know. She's the kicker. She's the kicker in that movie. She's the female soccer style kicker that kicks field goals. Bulimia is rarely fatal, uh, but can uh, have serious health consequences. Uh, laxative dependence, of course. Uh, hypoglycemia and, and lethargy from eating an unbalanced diet, uh, damaged teeth from hydrochloric acid in, the st in stomach juices, uh, tearing and bleeding in the esophagus from vomiting, anemia, and electrolyte imbalance. Uh, I haven't really seen this as a problem around here. Neither anorexia nor bulimia, I haven't really seen it. It's not very prevalent on most Indian reservations that I'm aware of. Unlike almost all mental illnesses, anorexia and bulimia sufferers are 75% female. Men don't really care to be that skinny. Before the 1970s, eating disorders only appeared among upper middle class women in Western cultures. And if you read a psychology text from the 80s or 90s, you may actually read that, that, uh, that bulimia and anorexia are uh, only seen in upper middle class uh, white uh, communities. Uh, before 1900, eating disorders were unheard of. Uh, it is estimated that people in the United States suffering from eating disorders, 0.6% are anorexic, 1% uh, are bul have bulimia nervosa, and 2.8% are binge eaters. They have binge eating disorders. And that is the end of chapter 8. I am on chapter 9. This is the ninth week. So tell your friends, all your friends, I'm sure you have lots of friends that care whether I caught up or not. Uh, I'm sure you do. Everybody cares whether I'm caught up or not. So the next chapter is about substance use, abuse, and addiction. We're going to cover all the things that we talk about in substance use and abuse. So uh, hopefully the uh, most of the information is the same, I hope. While a drug user merely uses drugs, a uh, drug abuser abuses a drug by the extent, uh, to the extent that uh, it impairs their biological, psychological, or social well-being. Worldwide, alcohol and tobacco are the most widely used drugs. Uh, I've already uh, uh, finalized your grades, so I've already put your grades up, so you can see your different grades. I guess I don't know how to do it. Anyway. Anyway, your, your grades are all up. 
Edison, of course, is in all my classes, so he's got four grades that are up. And I did that so I can leave tomorrow as soon as my I, I get done lecturing and I download my, my lectures. I can I can leave, pick up my dogs and take off. <clears throat> No offense, I love you, all you guys dearly, but I love my wife even more. So <laughs> I'm headed to Iowa to see if I can get happy. Yeah. <laughs> That's about that Texas. Uh, I'm, I'm flying through Texas. <laughs> Speed limit's 80 in Texas. Oh, yeah. Okay, it's 75. No, it's 70. No, it's 80. Yeah. <laughs> I can go 81 without any problem. I had fun on that. Really <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking off. <laughs> Uh, worldwide alcohol and tobacco are the most widely used drugs, of course. Uh, both of them are legal in just about all countries. Uh, tobacco is legal in all countries. Alcohol is legal in all countries except Muslim countries, where it is not really Ill illegal, but it's the, the religion uh, tells you you can't use it. Uh, we have troops in Muslim countries. Where, which countries am I talking about? Iraq and Afghanistan. And uh, you can talk to them about uh, how much alcohol they were given while they were over there. Uh, when we were in Vietnam, they used to, they used to uh, give us uh, barrels of, uh, of beers. Uh, they'd uh, pack it in ice and they'd, they'd helicopter it in uh, in the evening. And uh, so you'd have all this beer. And it was all false stuff. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> probably the worst beer ever made. Uh, yeah, yeah, really good stuff. But uh, of course, they can't do that in Afghanistan or uh, or Iraq because they're both Muslim countries. Uh, the abuse of illegal drugs, alcohol, and tobacco was the cause of more deaths, illnesses, and disabilities than any other preventable health condition. Uh, so people will voluntarily smoke cigarettes, they'll voluntarily drink alcohol, and that causes a lot of problems. Alcohol is the third largest risk factor for disease in the world after lack of food for children and unsafe sex. What unsafe sex are we talking about? Why are people, why is unsafe sex dangerous? What are people dying of? Disease. Especially in Africa. It's killed over 25 million people in, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, 2.5 million deaths a year occurred due to alcohol, most because of accidents caused by the alcohol. 320,000 deaths a year are caused by alcohol use by young adults, as stupid as that sounds. Wait a minute, it's, it's illegal for young adults to drink alcohol. How, how in the world are they getting it? Where's it coming from? I'm shocked. Who's giving it to them? <laughs> they can't buy it themselves, can they? You see it happen in movies and things. I'm sure that's that's fiction, right? Where do the kids get their beers? Bootleggers will sell it to them? Okay. This is a dry reservation. How I know where it all comes from. <laughs> I'm shocked. Alcohol is implicated in 40% of traffic accidents. I'm sorry, traffic deaths. 40% uh, of traffic deaths. Um, what was I thinking of? Oh, oh, oh. Uh, in, in the last class, we were talking about uh, uh, how dangerous it is to drive at, uh, in the morning, like between 1 and 4 o'clock in the morning. One out of every seven drivers is drunk on the highway. And this is all over the United States. It's not just on the reservation. Uh, the closer you are to a uh, border town, uh, the more likely that uh, people will be drinking on the reservation. A real serious problem on Pine Ridge Re Reservation. We have Shadron, which is right across the border. Mm -hmm. Pine Ridge is on, is in South Dakota, but Shadron is right on the... White Clay. White Clay? White Clay. Isn't that... Isn't that... For, yeah, yeah, yeah Shadron is where you put all the best of That's like right down the street. It is right down the street. Right. Small yeah. town, is like a... Small river, small border. border. Yeah. yeah, it's, it's in Nebraska. And Nebraska. It's like from Taylor to, to the store. Yeah. Um, it's ugly. It's ugly. And it's white people that's selling it to uh, native, native people. So. 
Alcohol has been identified in 36% of the adolescent traffic deaths. Half of all murders in the United States involve alcohol or some other drug. 80% of all suicide attempts. <laughs> 80 percent of all suicide attempts follow alcohol usage. There we go. So let's feed the kids alcohol. Maybe if we can train them to drink and smoke, it won't have such a strong effect. I'm just kidding. That's I just made that up. Globally, tobacco causes five million deaths annually. Uh, the number of estimated uh, is estimated to go up to eight million annually by 2030 unless we do something to control this. In 2010, 10% of graduating seniors had used Vicodin and 6% had used OxyContin. Uh, Six million people in the United States used prescription drugs for recreational use in 2010, and of course it's much, 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 much worse now. It is an epidemic in the United States. There are five methods of ad ad administration of, uh, of any type of drug. Uh, you can administer it orally, you can take a pill and swallow it. Uh, you could stick it up your rectum, that's known as a suppository. Suppository, you can, so you can use it, you can do it rectally. You can inject it with a needle, you can inhale it through your lungs, or you can absorb it through your skin. We have skin patches now for just about everything. Uh, Tom Petty, when he died, had two fentanyl patches on his arm. One of one kind and one of another kind. Uh, he had three types of fentanyl in his system. One from one patch, one from the other patch, and then he took an oral dose at the same time. The question is, did he commit suicide? Was it an accidental death, or did he just overdose? Was he used to doing this? And we don't have a clue of what was on his mind when he put all those two, those two patches on his body. Uh, the blood brain, oh, or, mm, the fastest, most potent means of getting drugs into the system is by inhalation, and the second fastest is by injection into the bloodstream. Uh, the blood brain barrier is the network of tightly packed capillaries that separates the blood and the brain, the blood brain barrier. This is very important because we don't want everything to get into our brains, uh, especially antibiotics. We really don't need antibiotics in, in our brains. Uh, but then again, we very rarely get infection in our brains. Uh, viruses can't cross the blood-brain barrier. Bacteria can't cross the blood-brain barrier. So how do people get infections in their brains? I'm sorry? <laughs> uh, what an idea. Uh, actually, it's almost that bad. <laughs> it gets in through your sinuses. You get a bacteria in your, in your brain, it usually gets in through your sinuses. Uh, drugs fast solubility determines uh, the ease with which it passes through this barrier as well as the placental barrier for pregnant mothers. Unlike the porous blood capillaries in most other parts of the body, body the, those in the brain are tightly packed forming a fatty glial sheath that provides a protective environment for the brain. The glial sheath develops from the nearby astrocytes to reach the brain, a drug first must be absorbed through the capillary wall and then through the fatty sheath. So it has to have that capability. It has to be small enough, a small enough molecule, that it can be absorbed through the capillary wall, and then it has to get through the fatty sheath in order to get into the brain. One of the things we're going to talk about is fat solubility. Alcohol is, is both water-soluble and fat-soluble, and that's why it gets into the brain so readily, unfortunately. <clears throat> Opiates are the same way. Once inside the brain, the drugs influence the activity of neurons at, at their synapses. Uh, drugs affect neurons in one of three ways. It e either acts as an agonist. Uh, the drug attaches to a receptor and produces neural actions that mimic or enhance those of a neurotransmitter. Uh, so it actually uh, acts as the neurotransmitter, and that's what an agonist is. Uh, and, or it can act as an antagonist. It acts the opposite. It blocks the action of the neurotransmitter, and that makes it an antagonist. Uh, by enhancing or blocking the reabsorption of the neurotransmitter, that's the third way that they can do it, uh, and that is the way that amphetamines work. Uh, they block the reuptake of um, uh, acetylcholine and dopamine, and that makes you that gives you the excitement that you have. 
then it makes you all nervous. Acetylcholine, remember that has to do with movement, so if you've got extra acetylcholine in your brain, you, you, you're moving and you don't, can't control it, so you get what they call the crack dance, crack dance. So you, you can't control yourself, you know, all kinds of interesting things going on. Crystal meth, of course, the people are scratching themselves all over because it feels like they've got, they've got bugs crawling all over them. So what they'll do is, this is fun, they'll shave their entire bodies because they want to get rid of the hair. <laughs> So you can tell if somebody is, is uh, a crackhead uh, or if they're on speed because they shave all the hair off their bodies. I had a, let's see, what was he to me? Uh, my niece's husband shaved every hair off his body. And when I saw him, I, I said, well, that's weird. Why, why did you do that? And he said, oh, uh, uh, I'm trying to lose weight. And I, uh, it makes me uh, exercise better because I don't have any hair to get in the way. Of course, I knew that that was a pile of mm -hmm. <laughs> Of any kind you want, a bull or a cow or buffalo, it really doesn't matter. It was still a pile. Um, then my mother died, which is a, a sad, sad thing, but uh, she gave everybody $20,000. So she gave $20,000 to my niece, and he immediately took it, and he was using really cheap drugs before. Now all of a sudden, he could afford really good drugs. <laughs> he overdosed and killed himself. I know. Isn't that a sad story? Well, I mean, there are a lot of sad things about that story, but here he is trying to, trying to tell me that the reason he shakes all the hair off his body is because he's trying to lose weight. What an idiot. I mean, he must have thought I was just dumb as dirt. What, a, what an idiot. <clears throat> anyway, he's dead. At 39, he overdosed. Yeah. Too young, way too young. He had two kids, and there was really no reason for him to do that. To overdose, I mean. <clears throat> Not to have the two kids. He had the two kids. Uh, one neurotransmitter that affects the strength of uh, dependence or addiction uh, of any drug is dopamine. Dopamine gives the individual a feeling similar to adrenaline. Cocaine and the amphetamines uh, produce their stimulating effect by binding to the proteins that normally transport dopamine, blocking its reuptake. And that's what I was saying. That's uh, why it makes you feel so good. The other is acetylcholine, of course, uh, and that has to do with the movements that they can't control. Uh, because the dopamine isn't reabsorbed, it is allowed to stay in the synapse longer, producing a stimulating effect that gives the individual a feeling of pleasure and excitement. Of course, cocaine only lasts for 10 to 20 minutes, but amphetamines will last for hours, for a couple of hours. Uh, if too much dopamine is left in the synapse in too great an abundance, or for a prolonged period of time, the individual might experience excitement that mirrors a psychotic episode. And of course, that's we have talked about the psychotic episodes. There's an ugly picture in the next, on the next slide, so don't look at it if you don't want to. We're going to talk about birth defects. And the, oh, I thought we were. Oh, we're not there yet, sorry. <laughs> Once inside the brain, the drugs influence the activity of neurons at their synapses. Uh, drugs affect neurons in one of three. Oh, I already talked about that. Wait a minute, I'm going the wrong direction. There we go, there we go. okay. This kid's got a cleft palate. Uh, the way the human body grows is that it grows in two halves, and the two halves grow together. So it forms as a, as a flat sheet, and then it grows together. And that's what happens with the face. Uh, one of the reasons that we talk about the, the symmetry being attractive is because uh, when, you, when your two halves grow together uh, and, and they, they fuse, uh, if they are symmetrical, if you have had good nutrition, if your mother had good nutrition, then all of that will be perfect. The symmetry will be perfect. Obviously, the symmetry in this child is not perfect. Uh, the palate didn't grow together. Uh, the interesting thing about the face is that uh, each half or portion of your face grows at a different rate. Uh, so your palate is one of the last things it forms. So the hair lip, the whole concept of a hair lip or a uh, cleft palate uh, is very real. 
Teratogens are drugs, chemicals, and environmental agents that can damage the developing fetus during the fetal development. And of course, uh, each drug has its own target. Uh, some drugs uh, will work on the teeth. Uh, if you take uh, tetracycline, if you take tetracycline while you're pregnant, this is one of the reasons why you have to check with your doctor before you take any medications. If you take tetracycline while you're pregnant, if a woman takes tetracycline while she's pregnant, the child will be born with brown or yellow teeth. Uh, the teeth, the enamel will, instead of being white, will be yellow or yellow to the point of uh, brown, uh, depending on how much she took. Um, I used to live in, uh, what is that, Lower Texas. Uh, people from Rio Doso, New Mexico, which is over there, somewhere. You don't know Rio Doso? It's, it's over in the northeast corner. Uh, people from Rio Doso, you can tell people from Rio Doso because when they, uh, there was something in their water and uh, they would have a brown line across the middle of their teeth. It was the oddest thing. Uh, so everybody from Rio Doso had this brown line, this interesting brown line. So somebody coming from Rio Doso to, to Lubbock, you knew that they were from Rio Doso because they had this odd brown line across the middle of their teeth. It had to do with one of the minerals in the, in the water in that area. Rio Doso. <clears throat> Drug addiction is a pattern of behavior characterized by physical as well as possible psychological dependence of a drug as well as the development of tolerance. Dependence is a state in which the use of a drug is required for a person to function normally. Uh, withdrawal is the unpleasant physical and psychological symptoms that occur when a person abruptly ceases using certain drugs. Tolerance is a state of progressively decreasing responsiveness to frequently used drugs. Uh, the hypersensitivity theory is the theory that, that addiction is the result of efforts by the body and the brain to counteract the effects of a drug to maintain an optimal internal state. And I talk about this all the time. This has to do with the uh, upregulation, downregulation, uh, whereas the, uh, the brain is trying to protect itself from the excess amount of, uh, of uh, neurotransmitter that you're pumping into its synapses. Tolerance is caused when the brain tries to protect itself by reducing the number of receptor sites, and that's upregulation and downregulation. We already know all the rest of that stuff. Uh, psychoactive drugs are drugs that affect mood, behavior, and cognition by altering the function of neurons in the brain and include hallucinogens, stimulants, and depressants. And of course, we are talking about all these in substance use and abuse, but we'll talk about them right now. Uh, hallucinogens are also called psychedelic drugs and include marijuana, LSD, and mescaline. I've had more arguments with people who tried to tell me that, that marijuana was not a hallucinogen, that it wasn't a psychedelic. They had never had, they, they've been smoking since they were five, and they've never, had, they've never had any hallucinations whatsoever. Okay. Hallucinogens uh, alter sens uh, sensory perception, uh, inducing visual and auditory hallucinations. The problem is they just don't know the definition of what a hallucination is. That's, that's really their problem. Stimulants include uh, nicotine, caffeine, cocaine, and amphetamines. Uh, stimulants boost activity in the central nervous system by altering the action of acetylcholine, the catecholamines. Uh, the catecholamines are norepinephrine and, and uh, epinephrine. Uh, and dopamine. Stimulants are widely abused because of their powerful reward effects. They make you feel good. With stimulants, there is a rapid development of physical and psychological dependence. Withdrawal from stimulants leads to increased appetite, weight gain, fatigue, uh, sleepiness, and in some cases, paranoia. Uh, but one of the aspects of almost all the drugs is that there is a paranoid aspect to all of these drugs. Uh, normally what happens uh, is that uh, uh, if you're using uh, and you're not using, if you, you, you're normally using and you're not using today, then you're, uh, all of these neurotransmitters are going to decline. You're going to have a downregulation of receptor sites. Now all of a sudden, you feel a dearth. You feel a, a, a vacuum. Uh, and because of that, it makes you feel paranoid. You feel, you feel like people are out to persecute you. And mostly it has to do with the neurotransmitters in your brain. Uh, of course, uh, how do we treat anxiety? 
Uh, we increase your GABA level. Well, GABA is one of the, the neurotransmitters that declines when you're not taking your drugs up does first. It, does I, it make you feel depressed when you're not taking your usual drugs? Are we, what, what are we, what, Just like any. any drugs? Uh, does it make you feel depressed usually? Because uh, the reason people take drugs is because it makes them feel so good and good. <laughs> right? It raises your serotonin level, yeah. it raises your GABA level, uh, it takes away the, the things that really bother you. So when you're not taking your, those drugs, whether they're legal or illegal, of course, all of those things. All of those uh, neurotransmitters decline, and since you have been taking, drinking so much booze, and it raises your serotonin level, uh, your brain is trying to protect itself by downregulating the, the uh, serotonin receptor sites and dopamine receptor sites and GABA receptor sites. So it's downregulating. So now that you're not drinking, you've decided to go cold turkey for today or tomorrow, however long you can handle it. Because of that, and it's down-regulated all those receptor sites, now you can't feel it as good as you would if you had never started drinking. Because you have the down-regulation of those receptor sites. So you feel worse than you would have if you'd never had anything to drink. And then, now you've got to find an excuse to go out and get the blitz. So what are you going to do? <laughs> What you're going to do is you're going to you're going to create chaos in your environment so that you have an excuse to go out and get blitz. That's what alcoholics do. They're so much fun. They're liars. They create chaos all around them. And it's so that they, they can go out and get drunk again. They need an excuse. Depressants are also called sedatives, tranquilizers, hypnotics, and include Barbiturates, opiates, alcohol, and general anesthetics. Low, dose, uh, redu low doses reduce sensory responsiveness and slows down your cognition. Uh, I told you about uh, during Vietnam, we were throwing Valium and Librium at everybody, especially the wives, uh, not especially the soldiers, where they want them to be uh, non-existent or non-functional. But we didn't care if their wives were not. Well, we were throwing all this stuff at them so that they wouldn't be so bugged about their husband being over in Vietnam and potentially being killed. Uh, higher doses, of course, produce drowsiness and lethargy. Uh, depressants are highly addictive and implicated in many suicides, accidental overdose deaths, and dependency. Depressants are often mixed with other drugs causing drug uh, potentiation. Uh, the effect of one drug uh, it increases the effects of another drug. It's also called synergism, uh, where one, uh, one plus one does no longer equals two if we're talking about drugs. If you mix alcohol, if you take your sedatives with uh, alcohol, it increases it by a factor of two, two to three. So it's multiplying it rather than adding it together. And that's known as synergism. Uh, opiates are drugs derived from the opium poppy, morphine, heroin, and codeine are three examples of opiates. Uh, opioids are synthetic opiates. Uh, the, these are the ones that, uh, that we have uh, come up with uh, looking at the chemical structure of opiates. Uh, Demerol, fentanyl, and Dilaudid are three examples of opioids. Uh, it is estimated that there are 12 to 14 million people worldwide who use heroin. A lot of them live in Europe. The Europeans, uh, heroin addiction is very common in Europe. And this is Russia. <laughs> as odd as that seems. Biomedical models uh, view physical dependence as a chronic brain disease. Now, biomedical model often assumes that addicts inherit, inherit a biological vul vulnerability to physical dependence. Concordance rate is the rate of agreement between a pair of twins for a given trait. Concordance uh, studies for monozygotic and dizygotic twins suggest that genes play a role in physical dependence with many psychoactive drugs. So some of these have a uh, genetic component to them. Uh, the withdrawal relief hypothesis is that the idea that uh, drugs use uh, 
Drug use serves to restore abnormally low levels of key neurotransmitters. Uh, support for withdrawal relief hypothesis or problems associated with neurotransmitters, uh, deficiencies, depression, anxiety, and low self-esteem. Uh, so how in the world do we feel better about ourselves? Well, we get drunk, uh, we, take, uh, we snort cocaine, uh, it increases our, our feelings of uh, self-esteem, uh, or it takes away our depression or our anxiety. The model doesn't uh, explain why addicts be, uh, begin taking a drug in the first place. Uh, the model doesn't explain why relapses are common even long after withdrawal symptoms have subsided. And that's really a, 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 a worrisome problem that, uh, that we have. Uh, why in the world do these people relapse? Uh, why are they going back? Why did Robin Williams uh, fall off the wagon after 17 years? Why does that happen? Uh, why do people still go to AA meetings and they, they've gotten a 20-year coin? Why do they do that? Why do they need to go to AA meetings? because relapse is, is just one drink away. It's one smell away. It's one something away. And the reality is that uh, there are a lot of people out there that uh, they won't, it doesn't bother them if you fall off the wagon. You know, they might, they, seeing your weakness might make them feel better. So they'll try to get you to fall off. They'll put things in front of you, trying to get you to, to, uh, uh, to relapse. Well, are, is there something wrong with these people? Well, these are your friends. These are your family members. Why in the world would they do this kind of stuff? And that has to do with their self-esteem as well. By, low, by uh, you faltering, it, it raises their self-esteem. That's why people like to see other people fail. The model, okay, we already talked about that stuff. So. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, the reward model, it, it, am I right or am I wrong? Okay, I know. Maybe, maybe on the reservation there's no people like that. <laughs> but I run into these people all the time. Uh, when I was working in the emergency room, we used to get uh, individuals who would come in and, you know, they'd been sober for 15 years and all of a sudden went off the wagon and drank a whole bottle of tequila and they were afraid that he was going to die. Well, who in the world gave him that bottle of tequila to begin with? Well, they usually were the ones that brought the individual in. Oh, I didn't know that was going to happen. Really? You didn't know that was going to happen? This guy's been an alcoholic. He was an alcoholic before and he's been sober for 15 years and you gave him a bottle of vodka or a bottle of tequila? What the hell is wrong with you? I didn't know that was going to happen. Uh, we could talk about codependency. Actually, we're going to talk about codependency in the next, uh, in the next uh, uh, class. But codependency has to do with the fact that uh, you want to be needed by that person. And sometimes alcohol is a really good way to uh, maintain control of people, is, uh, is through alcoholism. If you've ever watched any of these movies about uh, people trying to, to uh, get off their booze, uh, a lot of times the individual that they are with they need to leave in order to get off the booze because that person supports, they are acute to their, them using. Uh, and this is uh, relatively common. The reward model of use addiction is being motivated by pleasure seeking. Uh, cocaine, alcohol, and nicotine increase dopamine levels, putting the brain's reward system into overdrive. And that's why you smoke. Uh, if you've ever watched anybody smoke, uh, if they uh, started smoking before they were, I don't know, uh, before they were 12 or before they were 15 years old, if they've been smoking most of their lives. These individuals keep the cigarette in their mouth almost all the time. They will take puffs all the time. If you have somebody that didn't start until they were 21 years of age, they're probably not really addicted to, to nicotine. They're just smoking for another reason, because they want, it. it's for a social reason, potentially. And a lot of those individuals will just hold a cigarette, a lit cigarette in their hand, and maybe take two or three puffs off the thing, and uh, then they'll uh, stamp it out. And it's not even all the way down to the filter yet. You know, they're stop stamping out a cigarette that, that isn't anywhere close to being done. <clears throat> Why are we talking about this? Because we're talking about addiction. Uh, according to Olds and Milner in 1954, the septal uh, area of the hypothalamus is activated during all the psychoactive drug use leading to appetitive behavior. People who are dependent on one substance are more likely to be addicted to others as well. 
A gateway drug is a drug that serves as a stepping stone to the use of, the, of other, usually more dangerous drugs. And if you think of all of your friends, all your stoner friends from high school, uh, these individuals started out, uh, and they were the first kids in the class to smoke cigarettes. Uh, they were the first kids in the class to drink beer. They were the first kids in the class to start smoking uh, pot. And hopefully they're still alive, but potentially they're dead because they've gone on to bigger and better things, and those bigger and better things have killed them. Uh, a lot of these things are carcinogenic. Uh, marijuana is carcinogenic. Uh, we, I was talking to a lady that, uh, <laughs> in uh, Chinook, Montana. Chinook, Montana is a little town uh, between Haver and between the, uh, the Fort Belknap Indian Reservation. Uh, this lady had lived there all of her life. And she said, you know, I remember the first guys that smoked pot. There were five of them. There were five stoners in our town. Mm -hmm. And there's only one of them that's still alive. And there was. There was only one of them that was still alive. Uh, three of them had died of, of, of cancers. One of them had died of lung cancer, one died of brain tumor, and the other had died of leukemia. Um, and the other one uh, had died in an automobile accident. So there were, of the five guys, there was only one of them that was still alive. And the interesting thing about that guy, he smoked all the time. He was a stoner. He's still a stoner. He, if he could go out behind the school and smoke his marijuana, he'd do it. Of course, you can't do that anymore. Nobody smokes the school anymore. But the reason that he was still alive was because he was a swimming coach. And he was in good physical condition. And that's what kept him alive. The other guys were just kind of deadheads. And they all died of this, that, or the other. Well, they all died of one thing or another. Anyway, four of them were dead. It was really an interesting conversation. Anyway, we're talking about gateway drugs. So they start off, off smoking cigarettes in elementary school, probably, and then they have their first beer in junior high school, and then they have their first marijuana, probably, in, in somewhere in high school, maybe their uh, freshman or sophomore years. Some drugs that produce feelings of well-being are not considered physically addictive. Uh, the reward model is, is unable to explain why drug use continues even when unpleasant side effects occur. Uh, if you watch television, uh, here lately, the, uh, all the tobacco companies have had to put an advertisement on television about how addictive cigarettes are. Uh, the one that I saw the other day, I don't know if you watch regular television or even watch television, but uh, the one on the other day said that light cigarettes are just as addictive and are just as dangerous as regular cigarettes. There are no cigarettes that are safe. And that's what they were saying. And that was the, the three uh, tobacco companies. There's only three left in the United States. Uh, okay, the gateway hypothesis was developed because tobacco and alcohol use historically has been considered powerful predictors of use of marijuana and other illicit drugs. But newer research uh, findings indicate that environmental factors may have a stronger influence on the subsequent drug use. Economically deprived neighborhood environments, uh, we see a lot of drug use in uh, deprived neighborhoods. Uh, if you are exposed frequently to drugs, you're more likely to use drugs. And if you have, uh, have little parental control, uh, the young children are more likely to use drugs as well. Incentive sensitization theory, uh, it's a two-stage theory. Uh, the drugs, of course, make you feel good. Uh, drug use becomes automatic, automatic behavior, or automated behavior. Uh, it expands uh, on reward model, explained that repeated drug use sensitizes the brain's reward system to drug-related cues. Thus, they become conditioned stimuli that evoke dopamine release and craving. And, of course, you don't even have to smoke tobacco. You just have to think about it and you actually get a shot of uh, dopamine in your brain. Uh, and that's what makes you run outside and light that cigarette up because you've already, you've or, you're already been rewarded for even thinking about something. The dopamine is being released from your brain and now you feel really, really good. <sighs> and if you can't have that tobacco, you're, you're all nervous and uh, act erratically. Uh, social learning models view addiction as behavior shaped by learning as well as by social and cognitive factors. 
A person identifies with a particular drug, seeing oneself as a drinker, for example, which plays a role, uh, a key role in the initiation and the maintenance of, of an addiction. Really kind of interesting. I had a, a, a friend when I was in high school. Uh, actually, I had, he was, uh, we started the first grade together. And nobody liked this kid because, well, I don't know why people didn't like him. His skin was kind of rough. But his problem was he was a type 1 diabetic. Uh, so, and, and he, he, uh, he uh, memorized joke books, so he told a lot of jokes, and the jokes weren't very funny, because the joke books weren't very good. <laughs> he laughed about it. But I laughed at him. I was trying to, I, you know, I felt <laughs> sorry for him. Nobody, nobody people, was laughing. People wouldn't pay attention to him. It was really kind of tragic. Uh, so I went over to his house. Uh, I visited him. And uh, he, he uh, was in a uh, room with his older brother, uh, which was okay, that wasn't a problem. And his older brother was a um, comic book collector. So he had piled stacks and stacks of comic books, uh, which was always like Superman. You know, oh, cool stuff. You know, this is really kind of cool. My favorite were the Bizarro World Superman comic books. <laughs> Everything's backwards. <laughs> Everybody's a superman. Is really kind of fun. Uh, anyway, so Doug and I were, were really good friends uh, throughout most of our, our careers, or most of our high school careers. Uh, but Doug wanted to be just like Denny. Denny was his brother, and uh, Denny was was cool. He was cool. Denny was cool. Uh, had his hair combed back into a ducktail. Denny was always cool. Yeah. Uh, but Denny was a drinker. Now, if you know anything about diabetics, they can't really consume alcohol because alcohol turns into sugar. But you know, it breaks down into sugar in your stomach. It's the first thing that happens to it. So, as a diabetic, he couldn't drink, but he was really smart. So he could, he figured out a formula so that he could drink. Yeah. Yeah. And what he wanted to do was he wanted to be a drinker, just like Denny was. He wanted to mimic Denny's behavior. He died at 37 from diabetes. By the time he died, his skin was that thick. And that had to do with the diabetes. His skin was so rough. Uh, he didn't lose any body parts. Usually diabetics you know, lose circulation of the toes and they cut them off. Blue circulation in the feet and have to have to have to. Uh, But he didn't, that didn't happen. He drank himself. But he died at 37. Should never have Had an IQ in the 150s. The man was brilliant. Except he was stupid, you know? Why did he have to mimic, try to mimic his brother? Why couldn't he mimic some healthy person instead of Denny. And Denny's okay. Denny's okay today. He's a factory worker, goes home and drinks his beers every night. He's not a diabetic, so he doesn't have his problem whatsoever. But Doug wanted to be just like Denny. As sad as that was. Not at all. That, that'll break your heart. Uh, what else happened to him? Um, when he was a junior in high school, um, he was driving, drunk, and he wrecked his car and knocked all his teeth out, knocked all his bent teeth So, so uh, he, got, he got false teeth, which was okay. I mean, it looked just like he did before. But uh, because he was an alcoholic, his gums kept changing shapes and sizes so that he couldn't wear his false teeth. So every time we saw him, he had to take his false teeth out. Unless he hadn't been drinking, because drinking, of course, made him swell up. His gums swell up and put him on his pulse. And they were uncomfortable to wear if his gums were swollen. Uh, isn't this a sad story? And he died at 37. <laughs> nice guy. Shorter than I am. He was a pitcher. He, was, he had a, a really amazing curveball. Not important. I, I was his catcher, so 
According to the social control theory, the stronger a person's attachment to family, school, and other social institutions, the less likely he or she will break any social norms. Of course, he wasn't connected to any of these things. He wanted to be a hippie. And of course, this was before hippies, so he wanted to be a beatnik is what he wanted to be. He wanted to be a beatnik. Beatnik. Beatnik, yeah, I know, it's kind of odd. But he didn't have a, a connection to anything except me and Denny. I was, I was his lifeline. So when I went away to college, and I did go, go away to college, I stopped communicating with Doug. And it wasn't that much long, much later that Doug uh, uh, drifted into a really serious alcoholism. And then he died. <clears throat> 37. I graduated when I was 21. High school? From college. Huh? High school? Graduated from high school at 17. Graduated from college at 21. And, uh, then I went into the military. Of course, he was, he was a hippie. By this time, he was a hippie. And of course, hippies don't like military people. So you already had your bachelor's when you went into the military? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Didn't do me good. <laughs> it just meant that I didn't have to worry about my bachelor's degree while I was in the military. Uh, that's what's happening. Peer cluster theory maintains the peer groups are strong enough to overcome the controlling influence of such social institutions. When you drink a can of beer, of course none of us drink, but the, if we did drink a can of beer, 20% of the alcohol is immediately absorbed in, into the lining of your stomach and enters the bloodstream. It doesn't enter the bloodstream right away. I was telling you the story about the, the guy that drank the water. It, it uh, absorbs into your, into your stomach lining. It takes it, at, it about 30 minutes before it will actually get into your bloodstream. But, uh, yeah, so if you drink water, it'll, it'll, it'll bring it out of your stomach lining and now all of a sudden you're drunker than you were before. You got all that excess alcohol in your stomach. The remaining 80% uh, moves into the upper intestines, either rapidly or slowly, depending on the amount of food in the stomach, uh, slowing the process down. It takes a 175 pound man one hour to rid the body of one ounce of alcohol, uh, one 12 ounce can of beer, uh, a four ounce glass of wine, or a one ounce glass of 80 proof liquor. Women uh, don't have as much alcohol de dehydrogenase in their systems, in their stomachs, and uh, hence they metabolize alcohol much slower than men do. And for that women, that reason, women shouldn't try to match shots with men because they'll get drunk every time. They'll get drunk faster every time, just like this lady did. I'm assuming that's, yeah, it's lady. <laughs> blood alcohol level, uh, the amount of blood alcohol in the blood measured in grams is measured in grams per 100 milliliters. So we, ca we call it grams per cent. Uh, 0 0.8 grams per 100 milliliters of blood is considered legal intoxication in most states. Uh, up to 0 0.5 grams per cent uh, makes the user feel mildly euphoric. Uh, so that's about two-thirds of the way through your beer. Uh, blood level of 0 0.1 grams per percent makes memory and concentration dull and motor uh, function is impaired significantly. That's your second drink. Uh, between 0 0.1 grams per percent and 0 0.15 grams per cent, walking and fine motor skills become extremely difficult. That's your third can of beer, if you're drinking even fast enough, of course. Uh, 0 0.2 grams and, and uh, 0 0.25 grams uh, percent uh, vision oh, okay. uh, becomes blurry, vision becomes blurry, speech is slurred, Walking uh, without staggering is impossible, and the drinker may lose consciousness. Anything over 0 0.35 grams per cent may cause death. And of course, I've been in on these things. It's not a lot of fun. Remember, the alcohol continues to be uh, uh, taken into your system. Uh, there's no way that we can stop it. Uh, so if somebody comes in with alcohol poisoning, uh, they're just going to, depending on when, when they have their last drink, they're either going to get drunk, drunker and die, or, well, there's just nothing we can do. We can't walk them around and, and uh, accelerate the alcohol through their system. It'll just bring it, out, bring it out of their system, and they'll die faster. There's really nothing we can do. All we can do is sit there and hope that he didn't consume so much alcohol 
that it's going to be going to kill him, that we can actually bring him back before before he dies. That's all we can do. All we can do is watch and wait and see how much alcohol he actually took into the system. We can try to, try to dilute the alcohol with an IV, and that works to some extent, but not very much of an extent. I mean, we can't flood his body with, with excess fluids. We can't do that, but it'll kill him. So we just have to wait and see if he dies. It's really kind of tragic watching somebody die of alcohol poisoning. Because <clears throat> they just keep getting worse and worse and worse. Remember, it takes 60 to 90 minutes uh, since the last drink uh, before their peak of drunkenness. What about when they say that some people get shocked out of their drunkenness? Do they still Right. Go through that whole process? Yeah, well, it's, what they're doing is they're using a portion of the brain that uh, <laughs> isn't inebriated yet. Uh, and you can do that. You can, you can concentrate on certain things. If you can concentrate, you can act like you're not drunk. But that doesn't mean that you don't have that, that level of blood alcohol in your system. Remember, Amy Winehouse died, uh, what she at? Uh, 0.473 or something. 4, 4.7, uh, 0.474. Well, anything over 35 is dangerous. It's pretty close to death. It really all depends on your tolerance. Uh, but she died at, uh, about alcohol poisoning. Of course, she was a drinker anyway. And a uh, smoker of marijuana. <clears throat> uh, only about half the people in the United States are, are current drinkers. Only about 50%. Uh, current infrequent drinkers, about 13.6%. So that's about, uh, about two-thirds of the population. Two out of every three people drinks to some extent. <coughs> uh, lifetime abstainers, 21.3%. These are individuals that have never had, had a drink. Uh, the non-drinkers, about 36% of the population. About one out of every three is, is, not, is a non-drinker. And of, as I've told you, I am a non-drinker. So I'm not very tolerant of, uh, of these guys, especially these guys. I'm not very tolerant of those guys. I try to control myself, sometimes I can't. Uh, research in 2008 showed that about 50% of Americans 12 or older are current drinkers, with 14% reporting current but infrequent drinking. Now this is really kind of interesting. If we can't keep the kids from drinking at age 12, how can we keep them from smoking marijuana? If we legalize marijuana, which it's been legalized in like 10 states now, how are we going to keep the kids from smoking pot? It's illegal to sell kids alcohol, right? How are they getting their alcohol? That's one of the reasons I asked you that question before. How are they getting their alcohol? Bootleggers, okay? So they're, they're willing to give 12-year-olds alcohol? Brothers, sisters, who's giving these kids their alcohol? 30-year-old men trying to get 11-year-old girls drunk? Is that what's going on? Something's going on because they're getting the alcohol. So the other question is, how are we going to keep them from smoking pot? Pot makes you stupid. I mean, it really does. It lowers your IQ. It makes you dumb. It, it, it affects your short-term memory. So how, and if you start smoking before the age of 12, you can lower your IQ by 20 points. Well, I don't know how many IQ points you have, but I certainly don't have 20 points to give away. I really don't have 20 points to give away. So how in the world do we keep these kids from smoking pot? If we can't keep them from drinking alcohol, You don't even have to smoke pot. You can, you can eat it. A guy was just arrested, he's from California, he was just arrested with a, with a truckload of uh, edibles, candy bars, with marijuana in, in uh, Gallup, right outside of Gallup. They taste kind of gross, though. Hmm? You said they taste kind of gross. What? Having candy and peas and they, they put it in gummy bears. No. I don't like it. Gummy bears? No, chocolate. Oh, chocolate with marijuana in it? 
they used to put it in uh, brownies. They used to put it in brownies because it tastes well, kind of like chocolate. It has a, <laughs> so the question is, how can we keep these kids away from it? these 12-year-olds? Because they want to be cool. I mean, everybody wants to be cool, don't they? I mean, I want to be cool. That's why I dress in Hawaiian shirts over there. Not every day. <laughs> Only this week. So how do we keep the kids away from marijuana? Since it's going to make them dumb. We're going to be living that movie idiocracy. How can we do it? We're already find out. We're already living it, I'm afraid. Okay. Just a thought. What time is it? 48? I can get through this. At risk drinkers are drinkers who have two or more episodes of binge drinking uh, in the past month or consuming an average of two or more alcoholic drinks per day in the past month. At-risk drinkers are, are uh, most prevalent in the age groups uh, 25 to 44. Between the ages of 18 and 24, individuals have the highest rate of binge and heavy drinking, 18 and 24. And it's only legal for the people over the age of 21. Yet, these 18, 19, 20-year-olds are still getting alcohol somehow. Maybe they're getting it from their friends. Luckily, I don't have any friends. Compared with uh, women, uh, more men are current drinkers, binge drinkers, and heavy drinkers. Prevalence varies by ethnic and cultural background in the following order. European Americans drink the most. Hispanic Americans are number two. Number three is African Americans, and Asian Americans drink the least. Asian Americans, of course, have, uh, uh, don't have as much alcohol dehydrogenase in their stomachs, therefore they have a really negative reaction uh, when they drink alcohol. So where are American Indians in this list? Any guesses? At the bottom. Do you guys drink the least? Yeah. Well, maybe Navajos do. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe Navajos do, but go to the Pine Ridge Reservation sometime. We're actually above the Spanish. What's the interesting thing about Hispanics? Who are Hispanics? Who are those people? What are they white? Are they Indians? What are they? Are they just Spanish Spanish speakers? Does that make them different? Are they Europeans? They're Christopher Columbus? So all those Mexicans coming up here, they're all relatives of Christopher Columbus? Didn't they originate from Spain? I'm sorry? Didn't they originate from Spain? Well, kinda. But who in the world did they... Okay, so we're talking about ancestry here. So who in the world did they uh, make babies with? Native Americans. Yeah, Native Americans. So these guys are kind of somewhere in between, I guess. We invited them in. We did? And that's what happened. So if you go down to uh, Peru, for example, uh, the people down there uh, who are indigenous, uh, they are the Quechua. They are Quechua-speaking people. And of course, sometimes they marry into a, uh, the European family, the Spanish <coughs> family, a Spanish-speaking family. And then they, you know, they reproduce. And that's what we've got. we got the Spanish. So they're, Relatively dark complexion, but the, where do they get their dark complexion? You go to Spain, those Spanish people look like me. Oh, you need time to stop it. <laughs> <laughs>